Now, over the past, um, over the past number of weeks and months as we've uh, been in the book of Acts, we've, we've been focusing on different elements of it as we go, and and we're, we're going to shift a little bit today uh, and over the next number of weeks um, into a different theme. And I want to make this really clear at the outset. Our God is a truly great mastermind with a perfectly wise master plan to rescue the lost and bring them home. I know that for many of you, that there's maybe nothing in there that is, is new information to you, but can we, just, can we just sit on that truth for a moment again? Can we think that through f- together? Our God is a truly great mastermind with a perfectly wise master plan to rescue the lost and bring them home. And if it weren't true, then you and I wouldn't be here. And, and, and that's what we were talking about the, the past couple of weeks as we trace the, the line of, of sometimes fragile moments when, when the, the chain of, of the gospel shared and proclaimed and demonstrated has made its way for generations all the way to the point where somebody told you, and if they haven't yet, they are this morning, that Jesus Christ is the light of the world. He's the Savior of mankind He's held out to you by God the Father to, to, to be the, the, the lamb, the sacrifice in your place to, to literally bear and carry your sin and your brokenness and to, and to release that, to release you from it and to set you on a, a course of liberty and reconciliation with God. And, and, and for God to work all of this out across the whole globe and in all of his brilliance, We just have to stop sometimes and see, as we will over these next few chapters, that he's just a brilliant mastermind, and it's driven by a heart that that wants to rescue the lost and bring them home, and he's so wise in the way that he does it. Now, we all have our our plans, and we all have ideas of what's going to happen next and what we're up to. I could ask you what your plans are for this afternoon, and and even if you have none, to me, that's my favorite plan. (laughs) Absolutely. There's no plan I like better than not having a plan for a little bit of time. It doesn't happen that often, but I really enjoy it. Or maybe you have real uh, elaborate ones. Maybe it's a busy day. Maybe, maybe as you begin this fall, you have some, some, uh, some plans that you, you, you want to maybe do better in, in school, or you want to improve at the job, or you want to grow as a family, and you, you, you've got some, some pieces and some parts to that in mind. There's a common, uh, well-known quote in, uh, among um, in the military community that is a little bit hard to trace back. I think that probably it began in 1871, uh, spoken perhaps first by a Prussian field commander. His name is Helmuth von Moltke. So if that's your name, you should be a Prussian f- field commander. But he, I think he was credited with this, with this uh, quote that's been used in the military community for generations since. No plan survives first contact with the enemy. No plan survives first contact with the enemy. Now, a great 21st century philosopher, Mike Tyson, <laughs> put that in his own words when he said, everyone has a plan until they get punched in the face. That was leading up to the, the infamous uh, bout between him and Evander Holyfield, and, and, and there was a lot of talk of back and forth, uh, and, and, and there was a lot of strategi- strategizing, and, 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 and Holyfield was uh, perhaps, I'll say, likely the smarter of the two, and um, that wasn't nice. I'm sorry. I shouldn't. But he had a whole strategy, and, and the reporters were asking Mike Tyson about, about, well, do you have a plan? Do you have a strategy? Now, he didn't say at the moment, and I doubt that he knew at the moment, that the plan was to try to bite uh, Holyfield's ear off. But, but, uh, but his response was, everyone has a plan until they get punched in the face. I remember years ago, many years ago, we went through an exercise on our leadership team here at Northridge that was called master planning. Maybe, maybe that rings a bell for you. Uh, it's, it's an elaborate uh, strategy where you chart out 
uh, the, the essence of your vision as a church or as a company or even as a person. You try to, to boil down who you are and what your values are in maybe five or six words, and they go on one side of the chart. And then on the top side of the matrix, there's all kinds of other aspects that you need to fill out, like how, how are you going to uh, work on each one of those things in the next one year, the next three years, the next five years, the next ten years? And then you need to list some of the obstacles and the challenges. And then you need to list some of the resources. And then you need to list some of the steps that you would take. So it's a massive matrix of all of the different values and the core aspects that make you you and all of the different things that you need to, to plan for. And, and then all of that leads into steps to take. And, and it's, it's, if you are a flowchart person, are, do I have some, my, my flowchart people in here, anyone? Okay, I got one, two, all right, good deal. So y'all, we're gonna have a fellowship group afterwards. You know, if you're a whiteboard person, a, a, a flow chart person, whatever, you, but this thing is, is a thing of beauty. You know, it's, it's terrifying when you see it blank, but, but, but as you start to work out and it gets filled out, and some of us who are chart people, we start filling it out, not totally sure if we're, <laughs> we're thinking it through necessarily what we put, we just wanna see it filled out. And it just looks so beautiful. And then you put it up on the wall and you go, look, my master plan. My master plan. I remember I did that for the, for the youth ministry at the time. We did that for the church. And, and, then, and, and as a youth minister, as a youth pastor at the time, and we had our key values. We laid it all out. And you know what? Maybe it helped. I have no idea. I stuck it on the wall and I went about my business. And I think that happens a lot of times, right? It looks good, it feels good, but carrying it out is a whole nother story, and, 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 and we just spent a lot of time and a lot of effort into a really good exercise, and much smarter people than I have done that and then have followed it through, you know? And, and then others of us, we remember what it's like when you, when you build a plan, and then all of a sudden you get punched in the face, and something comes and it just T-bones the, uh, the whole plan, what you thought it was going to be like. And oftentimes, those are the moments when we feel the most despair, the most discouragement. And what happens is we begin to feel in those, in those times, we begin to feel distance between us and God. We make a plan. It doesn't work or it doesn't survive uh, first contact with the enemy. It goes all sideways. And then we look to God and we go, come on, get with the plan. But one of the things that we want to see and be reminded in the book of Acts is that God has a plan already. And it's good for us to think about, well, God, what's my place in it? What are you calling me to do? How can I be a part of your plan? But as we've been reminded a couple of times in this series, is that you, you could go with life like this. God loves you and has a, a wonderful plan for your life, and that's true. But remember how we flip that around, and I think it's so true as well that God, God loves you and he's given you a wonderful life for his plan. So Lord, how can I be a part of your plan? That's part of what we're gonna see here. Now, a lot of times we make bad plans. This past week I was uh, traveling for a few days, had some meetings down in Atlanta and I, was, uh, I flew down to Atlanta and um, Got, uh, I got, got on one of the really big, long escalators that go down. It's the busiest airport in the world, and it's packed. Every, it's just people wall-to-wall -wall everywhere. We're, we're riding this super long escalator down to a platform where you catch the train off to wherever. And everyone is herded down on these things, and, and I'm just sitting there, you know, just, just standing, and we're all just kind of going down long, long, long. And then, and then this all happened in a moment, of, like in, in just seconds. The person in front of me bumps back up into me. And, and you just kind of sort of startles you. And, and, and then another person, and, and people just started like bumping back up into me. And, and literally in, in just the, a few seconds, I and maybe some others realized that, that at the bottom of the escalator, someone had gotten to the place where you step off and decided that that would be a perfect place to tie their shoe. So they, they bend down to tie their shoe. They leave their suitcase right in the thing. And, uh, and, and I think they drop something in the process. And we're all just sort of stepping back as, as all of this happens. And, and just as I sort of reach and people are just sort of falling off to the side of, of the one, one side of the suitcase to the other, uh, a guy in front of me and me, and uh, we, we just happen to be able to sort of, 
shoved that suitcase out of the way and, and, and people were able to you know, walk off. And now, it, if it, we were just moments away from a full-blown incident that you might have seen on the news, right? Just people just pouring over the side. And, I, and we, we can all look at that person and go, what are you thinking? That's a bad plan, <laughs> you know? I mean, first of all, check your shoes before the escalator. That's, that's wise. But then if you need to tie them, then maybe just take a step, you know? And we can criticize that person, but isn't it true? I know it is for me that, boy, I can look back one week, one month, a year, 10 years, whatever. And I wish I could go back sometimes and talk to my one week ago, my one month ago, my 10 year ago self and say, you know what? That's a bad plan. <laughs> you need a better one. And other times when we're scrambling to try to put things together and, and it doesn't seem to us that God is attentive or that he's gonna come through or or that we can trust him, and that his plan, we know something about it, but I just don't, I, got, I really need to work these things out for myself. And then we go on into a pattern of living where it's really just our plan, and our prayers are about, God, would you bless my plan? So far in, in the book of Acts, we've talked about the name of Jesus. We've talked about how, how the disciples, as they began to move from that moment of Pentecost, they learned what it was to walk and to speak in the power of the name of Jesus. And then we saw for many chapters how the enemy's response to that was, was furious. It was raging. It was, it, it was intense. But every single plan of the enemy backfired on him. And that's pretty great, right? It was, it was, it's great to see when, when the plans of the enemy backfire, when the, when, when the enemy's plans get punched in the face. We love that. That's good. But now what we're going to see over these next chapters is that God is such a, a great mastermind with a perfectly wise master plan to rescue the lost and bring them home. Sun Tzu is a, a, a famous Chinese general in their military history and, and in his writings, The Art of War, he writes, victorious warriors win first and then go to war, while defeated warriors go to war first and then seek to win. Victorious warriors win first and then go to war, while defeated warriors go to war first and then seek to win. There's just great news here, is that God had his whole master plan all perfectly worked out because he is a mastermind. Before the very foundations of the earth were laid, he had the master plan all set, all ready. And he's going to win every battle for his own glory. And what we're going to see is we're going to watch this mastermind at work. We're going to watch his master plan unfold but we're going to see more of his heart behind it all. Now, you might think at this point, we're about to zoom way out, right? We're in Acts. We know that the gospel is going to start to spread all over. And, and, and we're, going to, we're going to see the big picture, a, a bird's eye view of the big plan. But instead, plot twist, we're going to go to see one man. Just one man. Because yes, God is a great master man with a perfectly wise master plan. He wants to rescue the lost. He wants to bring them home. But listen, he is not too big. He is not too busy to show up in the heart of just one person who's looking for him. I want us to be filled with awe at the mastermind that God is and the glory of his master plan to bring nations and generations home to him. But don't let us think that that means he's too big or too busy to care about or to show up in the heart of just one person who will look for him. And so that means me and that means you. So we're talking about Philip now, right? Philip, we, we just saw him in the past couple chapters. He was in Samaria and there was this huge outbreak, an incredible move of God. 
Remember that for him and the others to cross that boundary into Samaria was, was earth-shaking, and, and, it, and it meant so much to the Samaritan people. Oh, they had seen power before. They had heard things about God before, but they had never seen it change someone the way that they saw in the, in the lives of those uh, 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 disciples who showed up and said, hey, this Jesus is for you too, and we're brothers and we're sisters in him. I mean, it just blew their minds, and, and it created this whole... A sweeping revival that went across the city, the whole region. There were there were lives being changed. There, the whole the whole people were were changing. It was it was impacting the whole region. And it was in the midst of that that God interrupted, if you want to use that word, and he said and he said, Philip, I want you to go. Right in the midst of, man, the God, this was the plan. This is, this is a great plan. I mean, all the people are responding, and there's an incredible uh, uh, outpouring of, of your spirit, and people are, are being baptized, and, and lives are being changed, and there's so much work to do, and it's so great. Isn't this wonderful? And right in the midst of celebrating this great plan that God is unfolding in Samaria, he says it's time to go. And so he speaks to, uh, to Philip in, in 8, verse 26. Now, an angel of the Lord said to Philip, Go south to the road, the desert road, that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. He started out on his way, and he met an Ethiopian eunuch, an important official in charge of all the treasury uh, of Candace, or I want to say Klondike, but that's not that's what it says, <laughs> which means queen of the Ethiopians. The man had gone to Jerusalem to worship. And on his way home, he was sitting in this chariot to re read the book of Isaiah, the prophet. And the spirit told Philip, go to that chariot and stay near it. And then Philip ran up to the chariot and he heard the man reading Isaiah, the prophet. Do you understand what you are reading? Philip asked. How can I, he said, unless someone explains it to me. So he invited Philip to come up and sit with him. And this is the passage of scripture the eunuch was reading. He was led like a sheep to the slaughter. As a lamb before its shearer is silent, so he did not open his mouth. In his humiliation, he was deprived of justice. Who can speak of his descendants, for his life was taken from the earth. And the eunuch asked Philip, tell me, please, who is the prophet talking about, himself or someone else? And then Philip began with that very passage of Scripture, and he told him the good news about Jesus. And as they traveled along the road, they, they came to some water, and the eunuch said, Look, here's water. What can stand in the way of my being baptized? And he gave orders to stop the chariot, and then both Philip and the eunuch went down into the water, and Philip baptized him. Now, as we read the very beginning of, of this passage, I, I, I already have so many questions. Maybe you do, too. It begins again with, with Philip being interrupted from what he thought was the plan at the moment as God speaks to him through an angel of the Lord. Some versions will translate that the angel of the Lord. And, and I, don't, I, I can't pretend to know exactly, uh, exactly how, what this looked like or how, how or why God spoke to him this way. But one thing for sure is he got Philip's attention, Right? There's a lot going on, a lot of great things happening, and he got Philip's attention, sending him a, this messenger who said, I want you to go down south. I want you to start walking on the desert road. And did you notice he doesn't say what the plan is at this point? He doesn't lay out anything for him, but kind of like he spoke to Abraham a generations ago. He just said, I want, I want you to start walking. And so Philip, um, he, he said, okay. He started out there in verse 27. And, and, he, and as he started out, we, we meet this, this peculiar character. Man, so many, so many unanswered questions. I mean, it's, it's, it's really profound to, to see this character just sort of show up in the, in the midst of this great narrative of all of the big things that were happening. And, and now here's just this one man, and we have all of these questions about what is his backstory? I mean, who, I would love to know. I, I can't wait to find out someday. What, what, how... How and why did he become a eunuch? Part of, part of his physical body had been mutilated. It's hard to think about, but that's what had happened when, maybe, probably, as a very young child. Why? What was that for? 
I don't know. I, there, there's different theories out there. It could be that one, you know, one, one potential reason is that, is that certain people were, were uh, abused in this way. They, they were to, to, be, to limit them, to, to sort of keep them bound to service that, that they would be expected to fulfill, that they wouldn't be distracted or wouldn't have an, another life, another plan for themselves, but instead they would be bound to someone else's. I don't know that that's the story of this one, but, but we, we read that he was a, a high official, basically the treasurer for Candace, the queen of Ethiopia, which uh, would be in our modern-day Sudan. What about, what about the fact that he's clearly one of those God-fearing people? He, he comes from a faraway place. There's a great distance between him and the, 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 the Jews of Jerusalem in, in every way, but how was it that he became a, a God-fearer, that he was there in Jerusalem to, to worship, and now he's on his way back? How did he get a scroll? I don't, I don't know. A lot of unanswered questions here, but there's a lot to think about, and, and I just wonder... Out of all of those questions, isn't it interesting that, that Philip, and, Philip and, the, and the eunuch, they, they spoke in questions too. In verse 29, the Spirit speaks to Philip again. This was, this was the kind of the, the rest of the plan according to uh, what, what Philip understood. He'd been told to go down the road, so now the Spirit says, I want you to run up to that chariot, stay near it. And, and so he ran up alongside that chariot as it sort of plodded along. And and he heard the, the, the eunuch reading. It was common, uh, it's hard for me to imagine this, but it was common that, that when people read um, at that time, they would always read out loud. It would feel weird to read in, in, our, in, in their heads. Um, for me, it would feel weird the other way around if I was by myself, but that's okay. He heard, he heard him reading from Isaiah, and they started to ask each other questions, right? Do you understand what you're reading? It's a brilliant and insightful question. But I'm really focusing on the eunuch's question in response, how can I? And really, you kind of capture right there how, how, the, how the eunuch is feeling. What's, what's going on in his life is kind of like this roadblock. You know, he, he has, the, he has a, a heart for God. He's a, he's a, a God-fearer. He, he wants to worship God. But, but even as he's in Jerusalem, there are just roadblocks after roadblocks for him, for sure. And he somehow comes away with this scroll, and, he, and he's just confounded, and he's stuck, and he's frustrated. And, and how can I understand? I need someone to explain it to me. Philip had the key to unlock everything that the eunuch couldn't, couldn't put together there in verse 35. He began with that very passage of Scripture, and he told him the good news about Jesus. Remember, this is what Jesus did for some of his disciples right after his resurrection as he, as he showed that he himself was the key to unlock the whole story of the Old Testament. All that God had revealed so far could only be understood but so much until Jesus was placed as the key to it all. And now everything would become clear with him at the center. I want to just remind you this morning, that's true for you and me too. Not only is Jesus the key to understand every page in this book, but he himself, his ways, his words, his spirit, his nature, his character, his identity as, the, as Emmanuel, God with us, Jesus is the key to every unanswered question that we have. When we're stuck and we're locked and we're frustrated and maybe it's a situation, maybe it's an impossibility, maybe it's a fear, whatever it is, I just know and I say it to myself too, Jesus is the key to unlock that. So I need time with him. I need to see him. I need to hear him. I need to understand. I need to have him more clearly revealed to me so that God will reveal what the, what the question, how to get, un, the answer to the question is, how, how to get unlocked from this place. Jesus is the key. Maybe you're feeling stuck and frustrated and like there's a gap between you and God and you're thinking, my plan is T-boned. I got punched in the face. It's not working out. God, where are you? And I'm just telling you, Jesus is the key. So the more you see him, the more you lean into him, the more you read of him, the more you depend on him, the more time you spend with him, the more you see of him, then those questions get unlocked. 
And if nothing else, we learn that we have a God who is an absolute mastermind with a master plan. He can be trusted, and he's rescuing the lost and bringing them home, and he cares about not just the whole nations, but every single heart uh, of, of those who would look for him. The eunuch was reading from Isaiah 53, and presumably before we pick up in this moment, he was, you know, maybe a, a little bit earlier in, in, that, in that portion let me read some of it for you, this familiar passage from Isaiah 52. See, my servant will act wisely. He will be raised and lifted up and highly exalted. Just as there were many who were appalled at him, his appearance was so disfigured beyond that of any human being, and his form marred beyond human likeness. So he will sprinkle many nations, and kings will shut their mouths because of him. For what they were not told, they will see. And what they have not heard, they will understand. Who has believed our message? And to whom has the, the arm of the Lord been revealed? He grew up before him like a tender shoot, like a root out of dry ground. He had no beauty or majesty to attract us to him, nothing in his appearance that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by mankind. He was a man of suffering and familiar with pain, like one from whom people hide their faces. He was despised, and we held him in low esteem. Why? The eunuch was asking, who is this? Surely, verse 4, he took up our pain. He bore our suffering. Yet we considered him punished by God, stricken by him, and afflicted. And then as he continued to read, he, he read, as we saw right here in, in, in Acts 8, that, that, this, that this figure in, in Isaiah 43 was led to like a, a sheep to slaughter and, 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 and was deprived of justice and, and so on. And Philip explained to him, the good news about Jesus, that, that this was all about the one that he had no doubt heard about in his visit to Jerusalem, and, and, that, and that there was no one else that, that could have ever fulfilled all of, all of what was foretold here in, in Isaiah from 700 years ago. No figure in history could be the one foretold here except for Jesus. And, 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 and Isaiah's description of what had just taken place in that city with Jesus crucified and buried and raised from the dead in great victory and, and glory well, it was almost as if Isaiah was standing right there himself at the, at the foot of the cross and able to see it for himself. It was, it was incredible the, what he saw in the Spirit 700-some years earlier. And Philip began to explain the good news about Jesus, that, 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 there was, that the rest of the story, that there's, there, there's the promise of victorious resurrection, that all of this happened to, to carry away the sins of many from all nations to remove from us what stands between us and God. As we've said here often, to, to make our sins far and God close instead of the other way around. Yeah. He stepped in for the guilty, and that included even this man sitting in the chariot. But I, I want us to look more closely again. Look closely at what it was that the eunuch was reading at this moment. Right when Philip walked up to the chariot, I don't believe it was an accident that the, the eunuch was right here on these particular words that he was reading aloud. What did he read? He was like a sheep to the slaughter, a lamb before its shearer. He wasn't able to open his mouth. He was humiliated. He was deprived of justice. Who can speak of his descendants? Do you remember who this is? This is the eunuch who he himself, in his own story, had been led like, a, like a, a lamb without being able to defend himself and was abused and was mutilated, humiliated, deprived of justice. Who can speak of his descendants when everything depended on being able to have that line of sons to continue on your, 
your family line. And, and even though he held this great position of authority and importance, he himself, no doubt, saw a reflection who can speak of his descendants for his life was essentially taken from the earth. I am in awe when I hear the eunuch reading these words and coming up with the question, out of all of the questions we could ask, the eunuch's question is, who is this? Is he talking about himself or someone else? I wonder if he thought to himself, it sounds like my story. And to find out that this was actually the prophet Isaiah, seeing in the spirit Jesus, whom he had just heard about in Jerusalem, who was crucified, buried, raised again, and that he came to remove all that stood between us and God. This man had just been in Jerusalem as a God-fearer to worship, but as a eunuch, he wouldn't be allowed in the temple. He wouldn't be allowed to go there. there there's obstacles in his way. He wouldn't have been accepted. But now to realize that Jesus came to take away all that stands between us and God. That he himself matters to God. That, that God would take his transgressions away through Jesus. What the eunuch didn't know at the time was that Jesus saw him the whole time. He saw him and he had to find him. He left the city of Jerusalem, but Jesus wanted to chase him down. And so through the Holy Spirit, he spoke to Philip and he said, don't let that one get away. Get down to that road. There's someone I want, I want to talk to. I want to sit with. There's someone who's looking for me and I want him to find me. So go down to that road. You now go up to that chariot, sit down with him, listen to him. And Jesus, through a, a spirit filled Philip, found the man who was looking for God. See, God is truly an awesome mastermind with a perfectly wise master plan to rescue the lost of all nations and bring them home to him. But he is not too big and he's not too busy to show up in the heart of just one person who is looking for him. Do you see the value of just one person in the heart of God? And so when we look out over our city that we love and we want to bring hope to the nations, it's easy for us to get overwhelmed and it's easy to say, well, what's our plan? Is it going to work? I don't know if this is working. Where's the... But remember that God will always... He always has one person at least in front of you. He'll always put someone there in your path and we must not mis, uh, underestimate the value of just one person in the heart of God. I wonder if Luke, as he, as he uh, transcribed these words inspired by the Holy Spirit, I wonder if he remembered uh, what, it, what had been written earlier when in Luke 15, Jesus had been eating with, with, with people that the Pharisees considered sinners and, and outcasts, and Jesus told them this parable. Suppose one of you who has a hundred sheep loses one of them. Doesn't he leave the 99 in the open country to go after the lost sheep until he finds it? And when he finds it, he joyfully puts it on his shoulders and he goes home. And then he calls his friends and his neighbors together and he says, rejoice with me. I have found my lost sheep. I tell you, Jesus says, that in the same way. Oh, I turned two pages at once unfortunate. There will be more rejoicing in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who do not need to repent. We cannot underestimate the value of just one person in the heart of God. The eunuch believed both the word that he was reading and the messenger who explained it to him that Jesus is the key to understanding all of this and he actually came buried or crucified uh, risen from the dead buried risen from the dead for you. And then there was an immediate change in the way that he saw everything change so now they're going along look there's water why shouldn't I be baptized? And the question for this eunuch who had all these obstacles in the way is now, why not me? There were a hundred reasons why not him in his experience before, but now there's nothing between me and God because of Jesus. Why not me? And so they went down into the water and was baptized. 
And we close with this jaw-dropping, jaw-dropping mastermind moment that's just so delicious to read. In verse 39, when they came up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord suddenly took Philip away. Some translations would say he snatched him away. And the eunuch did not see him again, but went on his way rejoicing. And Philip, however, appeared at Azotus, which is about 15 miles north or so, traveled about preaching the gospel in all the towns until he reached Caesarea. This, this jaw-dropping mastermind moment where, where the mission was accomplished. I wanted to get to this one man, this one heart. He does, and he snatches him away, and he picks him up and puts him in another place. Now keep going, Philip. Keep going. There's a whole bunch of one more people that I want you to share with. And, I mean, among other things, one of the things we realize is that God is, is not limited by the rules of time and space. Right? He's outside them all. He, he can, I, I, I'll, just, I'll just pick you up from here like the little Google Maps guy, right? I'm going to pick you up, and I'm going to drop you right here, and I've got more for you to do. What I see is passion in the heart of God. I had to get to that one man. I had to get to him. He was looking for me, and I had to get to him. And then I got to him, and now I want you somewhere else. The passion and the limitless resources of the mastermind are astonishing. So let's wrap it up with a few applications for us. First of all, when God calls us to go, whatever you think the plan is, however well things might be going or how frustrating they're going or how much more work you have to do or whatever your plan is, when God calls us to go, to speak, to share, to give, to love, to to serve, remember, he's a mastermind with a master plan. He knows exactly what he's doing when he calls you to go, to love, to speak, to serve, to share. Say yes. Jesus is the key to his whole master plan. There's there's no other name under heaven given to men by by which we must be saved. The main reason for that is no other name is needed. He's completely sufficient. He's done it all perfectly for anybody, anytime, anywhere, who would trust him. He's also the key to your questions, your situations, your fears, your impossibilities. Don't believe the lie that God is too big or too busy to show up for you. He shows up for everyone who looks for him. You, just as one person, no matter how lost you may feel in the crowd or in your situation, you are valuable in the heart of God. And what you're carrying and the questions that you have about what you're facing and trying to figure out what's his plan and what am I supposed to be doing and what do I do now, what do I do next, whatever it might be, please be encouraged today. You personally are so valuable in the heart of God. But of course what that means is so is everyone else you see. And so when he calls you to speak, to smile, to pray, to love, to serve, to share, say yes. He's a mastermind. And he knows how to rescue people and bring them home. He promises that if we ask, we'll receive. If we seek him, we'll find him. If we knock, The door will be open. He's not hiding. Jesus is the key. Let's pray together. God, I want to thank you for this this beautiful picture of your heart for the whole world, all the nations, but also for one man who needed you desperately to show up and open his heart and open his mind to to know you. God, I know that maybe in this room there are folks who feel like you've been far away or that they haven't been able to measure up or that they haven't been able to, to fix themselves or whatever it is that the obstacles have been that seem impossible and insurmountable, but God, I just want to thank you so much. You have revealed to us, reminded us 
again today that every single one of the people you have made, the ones in this room and the ones we've never met, the ones who are happy and feeling satisfied and full and the ones who are in dark and lonely places and feeling as if they've been completely forgotten, every single one is so valuable in your heart. So Lord, I pray that for the one who feels like they're lost, maybe they are, that today they would lift their eyes to see you, say yes to you, believe you, trust you, be found in you, and come home. And I also ask, Lord, for us as a church, would you please continue to strengthen us and to lead us and to change us so that we're useful to you, that when you speak, no matter what's going on and what else we think the plan is, that we will say yes, because you're the master planner here. You're the mastermind, and, and we trust you, and you love people, and we want to be useful as you reach them. Lord, I also know there might be needs here that have nothing to do, seemingly, with what we've been talking about here, and, and someone here is just carrying something heavy that's, that's just too much to bear. And Lord, I know that you're more than able and more than willing to respond in our time of need. And so we lift our eyes to you and we pray, Lord, would you minister among us and through us? Let Jesus be seen and treasured. Let Jesus be obeyed and trusted. Let Jesus be our healer, our redeemer, and our friend. In your name, amen.